All right, so we've got uh, Mike Maroney uh, and, and Reese uh, and Desiree Hodge from History, uh, PhD candidate, who are here. Uh, again, this, this is a continuing series. We've got our Foreign Military Studies Office, uh, FENSO GR, GRA ships, uh, who, uh, as part of the, uh, you know, the requirements of that uh, program, are uh, giving a presentation. Okay, well, as fulfilling the requirement with this presentation, I'm showcasing my research on Uzbekistan's response to human trafficking and uh, approaches and barriers faced by the responses. My research goals were to focus primarily on official and non-official non -official responses. This includes state legislation, clarification, and NGO participation, and government cooperation with this participation. I was also interested in pursuing and researching known or suspected paths of transit. Transit out of Uzbekistan of these traffic persons, uh, international sponsorship and partnership in regional security organizations in preventing this human trafficking, and success and barriers faced in these approaches. The 2006, from 2006 to 2012, the United States assessment of Uzbekistan's performance in human trafficking legislation and prosecution was ranked at the tier two watch list level, uh, meaning that they did not fully comply with the standards as expected by the agreement, but were making an effort. In 2013, this year, <coughs> Uzbekistan was ranked on the tier three watch list, meaning does not fully comply and not making significant efforts. My research was to determine to what exactly no significant effort means. In 2008, oh, I see a little introduction here on the purposes of human trafficking. Uh, domestic labor and forced exploitation is the primary reason Uzbekistan uh, is placed on this tier three watch list, as according to the 2013 report. My research, though, primarily focuses on the international movements of this trafficking uh, for labor exploitation and sex exploitation abroad. The routes primarily, the common routes feed into Kazakhstan by land from what I've noticed in my research. Through three common routes, the Chernayevkaya, Zhivik Joling, and Yelma B. Konisbayeva crossing points. A map for reference, these three points are pretty close together here in the central tip of Uzbekistan, but they all feed into a main path of transit up north into Kazakhstan. And most of the reports that I've found indicate that individuals from neighboring towns and villages in this particular oblast of, of Uzbekistan were taken and arrived at destinations in Turkestan, for example, Kazakhstan, uh, then trans transferred north, further north into the Russian Federation and territories of Ben. So this is the primary land route that I've discovered in my research. In 2008, the state's response was criminalization. This is the first step to combating human trafficking. According to the code, trafficking in human beings, that is, the sale and persons or their recruitment, transporting, transfer, and harboring a receipt for exploitation, shall be punished with imprisonment from three to five years. So this is codified in, this, in the legislation. What remains to be seen, then, is the enactment of this legislation. In 2008, the Uzbek parliament, Oli Majlis, initiated a NGO support fund, basically to support NGOs who work against human trafficking and education and prevention measures. This is a visible level of state participation and coordination in the fight against human trafficking through the non-state sector. <clears throat> They've offered grants to these organizations since 2009, uh, totaling estimated $13.3 million from 2009 to 2013. 
However, these grants are divided among the entirety of NGOs within Uzbekistan, uh, available for competition for all registered NGOs, meaning that anti-trafficking NGOs are not specifically the sole recipients of these grants. <clears throat> so funding is still limited. There are grants for projects rehabilitating victims of trafficking and vocational classes for rural women. The key NGO response is in the civil sector, civil response. Social Initiatives Support Fund uh, is primarily funded by international organizations, corporations, domestic corporations, and other uh, even government sponsors, uh, sponsorships, the USAID, um, and various other international corporations. Uh, these then allocate funds to the Women's Committee of Uzbekistan, Istikboli Avlod, Makhala, Mekrami's Sizga, and Mekrami's Sizga also works with these rural education programs for the prevention of trafficking, and international and domestic funding and cooperation from foreign governments. I was also interested in the regional security partnerships that Uzbekistan's government engages in in preventing human trafficking. The OSE is primarily, uh, is considerably invested in the region in fighting against this human trafficking, uh, engaging in 2012 capacity building measures, uh, information sharing, training of police, health, uh, health and social workers to, better, to be able to better identify victims of human trafficking and prevent them. In 2013, there was pre there, this year, preventative measures uh, for training in vocational workshop, workshops in various regions, uh, various obelisks within Uzbekistan, and uh, businesses were even proposed. Uh, there was a proposal for businesses to be formed to hire victims uh, of, this, of this exploitation. More an international partnership, I discovered in my research, is a collaboration with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure. Through the Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure, RATS, Uzbekistan receives extradition benefits and extradition cooperation for suspected, uh, suspected perpetrators of trafficking and other transnational criminal activities. These extraditions then expedite the process of arresting and prosecuting those suspected, but it remains to be seen as I'll mention later, the, their fate once they arrive in Uzbekistan. <clears throat> the International Organization for Migration is also partnering with the Istikoli Avlog NGO for educating and preventing this trafficking activity. <clears throat> SEO members recognize arrest warrants. They collaborate with reporting and making these arrests. Um, much of the cases that I've come across were, were those situations where these individuals were picked up by Russian authorities or Kazakh authorities and then very quickly extradited to Uzbekistan. So these extradition agreements seem to be uh, producing some results and manifesting themselves. Arrests and extraditions are also coming from Kazakhstan, Russian Federation, Thailand, Turkey, and the United Arab Emirates. <clears throat> There are barriers, however, in this approach, and one of these would be false conviction. Conviction as a political tool, as some are accusing. A 60-year-old man, Bobo Murad Razakov, chairman of the Human Rights Society, Ezglik, there in Uzbekistan, was arrested on July 10th of this year, or, yeah, July 10th of this year, under Article 135 of Uzbekistan's Human Trafficking Code. Um, meaning that he was accused and arrested based on charges of human trafficking, though there was no specific indication that he was indeed involved in any sort of trafficking of persons. The 60-year-old man was the director of a human rights organization and not, not clearly some part of criminal, some criminal element. Many human rights watch organizations are accusing this measure as a political measure to silence a human rights advocate in Uzbekistan. 
False convictions like this could certainly skew the data Uzbek authorities report to the United States and in formulation of future trafficking reports. <clears throat> Another barrier is bribery and complicity of border guards and border officials in Uzbekistan and even regional and city administrators. The Chinaz case with Mukhidin Kozimuradov accused of trafficking four Uzbek men from Chinaz to, Tur to Turkestan and Kazakhstan. These men were beaten, forced to work in Turkestan at a, this car wash and just subjected to these abject living conditions. <clears throat> there was accusation of widespread involvement of officials, particularly levied by their, a sister of one of these men, Anwar Ziaev Gulnaz Yuldasheva. She accused officials of complicity in this activity and was summarily in 2012, just a year after this incident, incarcerated and accused of extortion and blackmail. Another barrier being opacity of data. The data released and given by Uzbek officials to Uzbek authorities is not perceived as being reliable or revealing necessarily of prosecutions and convictions. And in particular with cases such as these, uh, as, as previously mentioned, the Uzbek government needs to <clears throat> the data on convictions um, and arrests need to, need to be more revealing and consistent. Conclusions that can be drawn from this are that trafficking in persons is criminalized and codified into legis legislation. The northern route to Kazakhstan is the most used route. Formal state representation and, and sponsorship of NGOs is occurring. So, and this is noted in the trafficking report, but it should also be mentioned in future, mentioned and considered in future reports. There's a substantial international collaboration for security and prevention <coughs> with NGOs participating in funding operations and co other coordination. And the security organizations with OSCE, SCO, and IOM. There's a substantial regional security partnership that Uzbekistan is participating in. The barriers, though, being false convictions, opacity in reporting, leading to a mixed result in application, which is why, in 2013, Uzbekistan was moved to the Tier 3 watch list, or Tier 3 of, uh, of the Trafficking in Persons Report. That's it. Folks, I'll ask you to take note of your questions, kind of hold those uh, 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 for now, and then uh, we'll, we'll take a general Q&A session after Desiree has finished her presentation. Fimso and also Ray Finch for giving me wonderful suggestions throughout this past semester. I was interested in researching what is called the Foreign Agents Law. Uh, it's the nickname of the law. The law has a very long name that I will spare you from. <laughs> and I'll give you a bit of background. Um, there are about 220,000 NGOs registered in Russia, and about 50 of those work in the human rights area. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is the application of this foreign agent law and how it has specifically targeted human rights NGOs. So in July 2012, President Putin signed the law and it went into force on November 21st. So we're a little over a year anniversary of its enactment. And what this law did was uh, it put certain NGOs that are not financed by the state so any NGO receiving external sources outside of Russia under the purview of the Ministry of Justice. And if they received money and if they participated in political activities, which is a contested term in the law, then they had to register themselves as a foreign agent. 
And registering um, as a foreign agent brought some responsibilities with it. They had to publish biannual reports, undergo financial audits, and they were subject to unannounced inspections, which I'll discuss in more detail as I go on. And they also had to put on any publication that they were a foreign agent, and they were funded by a foreign agent, and this raises a lot of complaints from many NGO leaders. And so the purpose of my project was to track how is this law being enforced and what NGOs are being affected by it. And I originally thought when I approached the research that I'd just have a listing of uh, enforcements and examples of the enforcement for you, which I do have. But I also found that this law, I think, is being used, it's the argument that I put forth, is being used as a cornerstone of a larger campaign that has uh, historical underpinnings and that also is being combined with an expansion of Russian government uh, aid to NGOs that it selects in the form of presidential grants and also through the expansion of a term called socially oriented NGOs. And I will discuss all of those later. So first, proponents of this law. The law was a proposal of a United Russia Party member who said that, you know, this law will help us to inform Russians who have, in the past year, been protesting a bit more than recently, that all of these protests, most of them, are being supported and financed by Americans. Uh, the U.S. State Department, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, has categorically denied this. Uh, they also say that it reduces international influence on Russian internal domestic politics, but if you read the comments and you look at the statements that are being made, they're addressing specifically America's influence on their internal politics. Opponents of the law say that, number one, if you register as a foreign agent, foreign agent doesn't sound pleasant to anyone. I think everyone can agree. Right? It has some sort of connotation of being related to the Cold War era. They seem like they're spies. The Council of Europe has condemned the term, saying, you know, this is the language that was used during the Stalinist time, and that it's really not conforming to international standards that other uh, countries have concerning their NGOs. They also have problems with the term political activities, because if you read the definition that I had on the previous sl slide, participating and organizing and implementing political actions aimed at influencing decision making. That is broad. And the Russian prosecutors have had a field day uh, enforcing this and trying to determine what is a political activity that influences, influences decision making. And when I go through some of the enforcement examples, you'll see that it's very wide and a bit <coughs> at times of what qualifies. <coughs> Often it is determined by the prosecutor who's filing the charge. So then I tried to figure out, okay, well, these are what the opponents are saying, mostly the uh, NGO leaders, and then the proponents are mostly United Russian um, leaders, and then so I thought, well, I should figure out what Putin says, and Putin, as usual, is a mysterious man. I found some very interesting quotes from him. I found one quote that said, yes, there are problems with this, there are problems with this terminology of political activities. We don't know what it means and we should define it more clearly. And I said, okay, well this maybe is interested in changing the law. Then I uh, read an, uh, a statement by him where he was uh, talking to his human rights council saying, the law doesn't have to be more strict or more lenient, which to me means it might just stay the way it is. I don't really know. And then there's another quote where he said that NGOs are jackals who count on the support of foreign funds and not their own people, which leads me to say, I think he has a you know, he likes it, and he probably wants to keep the law. <laughs> so I then tried to find a historical explanation, and, and then I found this quote, which I think was given at the Valdai meeting, which when Putin gives to the media his opinions on certain topics. So he, he has this uh, long quote where he stresses an idea of a Russian civil society, right, that's built on a historical Russian legacy, that you know, Russians really have an idea of what their civil society should be, and outsiders do not. So I take this to mean that he wants Russians to determine who will get money in their society, what types of NGOs will participate in that society, and someone you know nationally focused has the interest of Russia at hand. 
And then I also looked at several articles, mainly from the political science field, so I'm not too familiar with the, the theories or the re some of the research behind that, but a couple of political scientists said that many of his concerns about building a Russian civil society occurred in 2004 with Ukraine's Orange Revolution. And many members of his administration thought that though that revolution was sponsored by Americans and American NGOs. And so after that happens, you see that Putin's, uh, the Putin administration creates more strict and uh, more tight regulations on these NGOs. And that comes in, the, mainly in 2006, several things happen. Uh, number one, this is the first wide sweeping reform of laws concerning NGOs. So NGOs uh, have to go through very detailed registration, reporting, and tax requirements, and failure to comp comply, if they receive two warnings for the same violation, the government has the ability to dissolve them. Uh, a lot of NGOs said that we are being drowned in paperwork. We cannot fulfill our obligations because of this new law, and it's taking us away from what we should be doing. The administration said, well, no, really, we're just trying to see who's operating our country. At that time, in 2006, they institute, the, go the government institutes the presidential grants, which starts at a roughly, I think, 230 million rubles for NGOs working in uh, social spheres, including human rights. So you see the first onset of funding combining with this uh, 2006 law, and then Putin also forms the Public Changer, a Chamber, which is an organization that's charged with bringing citizens initiatives to the attention of the president and you know they're charged with making sure that uh, bringing NGOs into a discussion of the laws that are being made but our uh, critics say that this organization Putin picks the first third then that third picks the next third and the final third is picked by the existing selectees so there's a lot of criticism saying that in 2006 when you have the more strict regulations, you have the institution of the public, uh, presidential grants, excuse me, and then you have the formation of this public chamber. These are the historical underpinnings of this 2012 law that I traced. And it, all this is leading to justify Putin's position that there should be some sort of national spiritual identity embedded into a civic society that NGOs participate in. Okay, so actual enforcement. I had way too much fun with Google Maps. And if I had more time, you'd have way more maps. So what I did is Human Rights Watch has a wonderful list that they update of every charge brought against an NGO and also the status of that. It's about two weeks old, so I'm, I'm using data that's roughly two weeks old and I've updated it in one case. But I went ahead and put all of the cities where um, NGOs have been affected by the Foreign Agents Law. And as you can see, it's, it's all over. As you go toward the east, those organizations are mainly environmental organizations. The bulk of them are focused in European Russia, Russia, and the bulk of them are human rights organizations. So when you look at the list, it's human rights organizations and environmental organizations that are being targeted. Enforcement occurred in several waves. The law went into force on November 2012. Nothing happened for about two and a half months, three months. Putin gave a speech to his security service saying, we need to enforce the law in February. February, the law started to be enforced, and inspections started in March. You also had a, a season of appeals, which is ongoing, but started basically late spring, early summer, continued throughout the summer, ongoing. And a new wave of inspections that uh, was authorized for the fall, Yuri Chaika, Russia's prosecutor general, does not plan to end inspections. Uh, and the constitutional court is actually going to roll on what political activities means, is it too vague, and even be, they are hearing the case, they will make a decision, and Yuri Chaika does not want to wait. So we have new inspections. Types of penalties, suspension, civil court cases, administrative court cases, notice, notifications of violations, and then warnings that you might be stepping on a line where you will soon violate the law, so just be careful. Uh, the picture here is, uh, was spray painted a day before the uh, enactment on a Moscow building that houses three prominent NGOs, so it says, you know, a foreign agent loves, you know, love the USA. Um, 
So these inspections are really interesting because it's not just the prosecutor, it's not someone from the Ministry of Justice, they're sending everyone. They send the fire services to make sure your building complies with uh, fire standards, which, if you've ever been to Russia, <laughs> I don't know if many buildings comply. I mean, there's some safety standards. They send people to look at computers to make sure that their software is registered. Well, let's, let's be honest here, like if you've been there. So these are minor violations, right? So they're, they have tax officials, they have people looking at their computers, they have the fire marshals coming in, they have all these people looking at a whole range of violations. And the only authority that they need is a complaint or suspicion that they are violating some law just to go in. So NGO leaders have claimed that these inspections are arbitrary, they're uh, usually accompanied by an NTV TV camera, publicizing the inspections, and that sometimes they get rough. That off camera, people get beat up, they get intimidated. So these are the types of things we're seeing. So the actual results of these, as of November 27th, um, there have been two suspensions, and a, sus a suspension means that the assets are frozen, they're bank assets, they cannot engage with the press, they cannot organize outreach programs, or they can be um, subject to additional fines and penalties. And this only occurred to Golos, two, um, two organizations in Moscow. One is Golos, you know, the uh, Regional Public Association in Defense of Democratic Rights and Freedoms, and the other is in defense of voters' rights. The one that's in defense of voters' rights closed due to the fines. Um, they were very um, heavy fines. They couldn't afford to pay them. Closed, reorganized itself as a new NGO, observed the elections. Um, but these are the only two organizations that had their activities suspended, and they were both funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. I want to jump to the administrative court cases, and again, these are all in European Russia, and they, you can be fined up to $16,000 per organization, and up to $10,000 if you're a leader of an organization. All of these organizations work in human rights, their funding came from uh, Helsinki Group, UN, the governments of the Netherlands, Norway, and the CS Mott Foundation. And their projects that they were cited as being, uh, you know, they were cited for, and they were accused of being a foreign agency, included inviting a U.S. Embassy official, Howard Sullivan, a KU alum, to discuss U.S.-Russia reset. He would be a perfect person to invite because he is the head, I believe, political minister and the political section of the U.S. Embassy. Um, Participating in campa campaigns promoting awareness of LGBT issues and publishing studies on historical political activism in Russia. And thus far, all of the administrative charges were dropped except Golos. And now what the Russian government has started doing is that they can't win the administrative court cases. And these are the severe ones, right below, right below the suspension. They're opening up civil suits in court, which would make them register as a foreign agent. There are currently four civil suits filed. One was just, one was successful. And so people are worrying that that civil suit is going to open up um, opportunities for more prosecutors to file civil actions if they can't win the administrative court cases. 18 official notices of violations, and this means that they're warned that you have to register as a foreign agent within one month or you're going to face a penalty. And these include NGOs all over Russia, and they, again, work in human rights, and they address social policies, uh, history of totalitarianism, youth participation in government, election monitoring, constitutional law. And sources of funding, again, for most of these were U UN and National Endowment for Democracy. Last, oh wait, lastly, 53 warnings not to violate the law. Most of these are environmental organizations in, in Eastern Russia. One was a human rights organization, it was a branch of Golos, and they successfully defended the warning. And so people who are against the law say, hey, this is great, we successfully defended against warning in several um, administrative court cases, so there is hope that the judicial system is not agreeing with uh, prosecutors. Assessing public opinion, um, most Russians supported the law, 53% said that they supported sanctioning. What's interesting to me is the people who have never 
heard of the term NGO or have a negative opinion. And I think that this, uh, this poll conducted by a suspected foreign agent is very telling. <laughs> <laughs> it's very telling because the, the purpose was to apply it to U.S. security, right? The U.S. is not in favor of this law. The you know, State Department does not like it. Most international observers don't like it. But Russians like it. Why do Russians like it? Most of them don't really understand what an NGO does. They don't know anyone who has volunteered. And also, historical trends, volunteer rates in Russia. The Levada Center published a volunteer rate at 3%. 3% of Russians volunteer at NGOs. Another uh, study that I looked at, also an uh, accused foreign agent, 1%. So you have very low trends in volunteerism. And then there's this legacy of Soviet mass associations, right? People were made to participate in community projects during the Soviet era, and they distrust the people who led them, and they didn't want to do it most of the time. So they're not really rushing to go volunteer or get involved in the NGO, especially if they face charges and they can be accused of being foreign agents. So the large part of my paper, and I'll just briefly summarize, is that this is a cornerstone of a larger campaign. So you have this law that creates a whole bunch of barriers legally and tarnishes the viewpoint or the, the actions of NGOs in the public's eyes. But you also have an uh, influx of money coming in. So the presidential grants start in 2006, as I stated earlier, 230 million rubles. This year, 2.3 billion rubles. The large increase in money. They plan to make it $3 billion next year. The competition is a competition. They submit applications, and you submit applications, and they have to get approved. Critics, and uh, Commerçant, I believe, Commerçant or Vietnamese, they published an expose on this, saying, this is probably very corrupt, because the people on the, who organize it, or who put in charge of reviewing the applications and dispersing the money, were all friends of Putin or had worked on the presidential council. Some of them, at one point, the public chamber managed this, which Putin selects the first third of it. So there are a lot of arguments saying that this is a way for the government to pay NGOs who have no other funds of money because they can't take funds from abroad and they don't want to register as NGOs, pay them and make them dependent on this funding for their livelihood. There's lots of criticism. The first criticism was, well, when it first started, the public chamber organized it. So Putin said, all right, we're not going to have the public chamber organize it. I'm going to pick NGO leaders. You're going to apply to them. They're going to disperse the funds. This is Ella Pamphilova. She was the one who managed the second round, which was released at the end of November. Um, the funding was, they awarded the funding, and they're going to disperse it, I believe, in or December or late January. I can't recall. But she has been accused of being unfair. She was the former head of the Human Rights Council, so she has connections to the administration. So they said next time around, she won't be organizing it. So there's a pattern. There's an awards dispersal. There's complaints. The government fixes it. There's more complaints. The government fixes it. Whether the government is trying to be very transparent and address the concerns is a question, or is the government trying to placate criticism? Um, I don't know. I think we wait. To, we have to wait to see on that. Again, the second thing I think they're doing is expanding this term socially oriented NGOs. And I actually need to, to read this. Um, a socially oriented NGO. These started under President Medvedev's administration, 2010. And to be considered this type of NGO, uh, the NGO has to work in social and legal protection of citizens, disaster relief, social conflicts, protection of the environment and cultural monuments, prevention of socially dangerous behavior and corruption, charitable, educational, and volunteer activities, or to develop international cooperation and patriotic education. Most of the NGOs that have been targeted <coughs> somehow don't fall into this category, so they're not eligible for the funds. But what the government has done in this, the past five months of me researching this topic is they've expanded it to include drug rehabilitation centers, which used to be uh, only state-run institutions. They had some, well, I should say state-run institu state institutions were prevalent. And then you had Protestant religions opening up their own drug rehab pr um, programs, which received a lot of criticism. The government is expanding it to include these Protestant organizations. 
proponents say, hey, we're helping more people. Opponents say, no, you just want to have a hand in the Protestant um, churches and their campaigns. Also, they're saying, well, now the Russian Orthodox is going to get a ton of money because the Russian Orthodox is going to open up a lot of uh, centers, or if they have one going, they're going to get uh, an influx of cash. You also have the expansion into anti-corruption um, and cultural preservation, which my definition included. No one really, uh, you know, no one had objections to this. This was pretty much, you know, this is a great thing. We want to do it. Then illegal immigration. This is one that's a really hot topic now. People are, are the press is reporting on it. Illegal immigrants. If you, get, if you, the government gives money to NGOs who help stop illegal immigration, this is just participating in a campaign that the government has been trying to take on and combat for many years now. So they say that the government's reaching into areas that traditionally they. They would have been working with NGOs on this. So, so my argument is that it's not only the NGO law, it's the influx of money that you're seeing as well. So you're just reducing the dependency on NGOs to outside sources of funding. So my conclusion is, is this beneficial or harmful, or are there really foreign agents? And I think it depends on who you ask. Yuri Chaika, Russia's prosecutor general, would definitely say yes. He has even accused members of the Presidential Human Rights Council of being uh, foreign agents. He's include he's uh, accused other embassy workers, not only U.S. workers, but also other countries' embassy workers of being foreign agents. So Putin would say yes, or Mike would say yes. I think Putin would say yes, given his statements and the crackdown that we've seen. I think he would say yes. The Ministry of Justice and the prosecutors are unrelenting, they are continuing to file charges, so it's something that they believe in or they're given an order from above to keep enforcing this law. The court system and the judges hearing the cases, I think it's too early to say, but I think that there's it's a mixed bag with them. I mean, you can see by how many administrative court cases um, have been overturned and how many NGOs have been winning that the court system is sort of in between at this time. NGO leaders would say we're definitely not foreign agents. A lot of NGO leaders have published in English and in Russian statements saying why they are not foreign agents, that they are just fulfilling a need in society that the government's not addressing. And how does it apply to US security and US Russian relations? In my assessment, I don't think it's any surprise that the US government or the US State Department particularly uses soft diplomacy. Right to advance its uh, values and its goals. Uh, that's why we have public diplomacy offices at embassies. Right, you, you spread information about America, what America is doing, our values, and in Russia and in America, there are certain stereotypes. You know, we all have stereotypes of individuals or countries, and the first line of breaking down those stereotypes is when you meet that person. Right, when you interact with a different. Uh, a person from a different country or a different culture, that interaction builds, uh, I think, a foundational relationship where you can start to break down some of these barriers. But also working with them, you find you have mutual interests. If Russians are afraid to work with granting agencies from the United States, from the U.S. Embassy, from the State Department, Many of them have stated that they're no longer going to apply for this funding, right? That would have brought this interaction together. So I think at a base level, this does have implications for security, for, or at least for the U.S.'s interest, because we're taking away that ground level where people meet and interact. And without that, you have a, a very a aggressive Russian media who is anti-American in many ways, and you have a public that doesn't really understand NGOs, that doesn't really have any experience with them. And so I think that's just another step that's straining our relations with Russia at the moment. And that is what I have. I'll be happy to take suggestions or comments or questions.